Happy Sabbath, brethren. Good morning. Happy, Happy to see all your beautiful faces. I haven't seen you guys in quite a minute. I was in Ohio. Everyone from headquarters says hello. Give my regards to uh, New York City. All right. Well, I want you to think back of when you first met uh, your spouse. I want you to think about how exciting that day was, how new it felt, the, the butterflies that went through your stomach, and how just new everything felt. Everything felt fresh, right? Um, you thanked each other constantly. You gave each other words of encouragement all the time. But you know, over the, over the years that, you know, love or being in love can, can evolve, right? It, it takes on more of a, of a nurture eventually. And those butterflies, they, they sometimes go away. And, and a lot of people in the world, they think that they've fallen out of love when really just love has evolved. Love has evolved. You ever see uh, two old people and they're so, they're so close, right? And you wonder, what kind of love is that? That's definitely a different kind of love than when you first meet somebody, uh, maybe when you're 18, 19, or 20. It's a, it's a forever kind of love. It's a nurture kind of love. A love that brings you together. And you, you feel like, you ever hear people say, like, I wish that we both can just pass away and die at the same time, together. And that's how I'm sure a lot of you all think, because nobody wants to be left behind, right? Nobody here wants to be left behind. It would be much better if it happened that way all the time, but, but it doesn't. But what if I were to tell you that the way that you are in love with your spouse or the way that your love evolves with your spouse, those, those beautiful feelings that you get, that's the only time, you're, the only time you're supposed to have those feelings forever is when you're in love with God, right? Uh, Jesus talks about uh, the church at Ephesus that they have left their first love that they've left their first love. And what does Jesus mean by this? Does he mean that we're supposed to be in love with him? I think so. That we're, our first love is supposed to be with God. And in this physical life, our, our first love we think of as just our, our spouse. But even more so with God. Even more so with God. When we, when we fall in love with God, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And when we fall in love with God, we learn how to fall deeper in love with our spouse. Because God teaches us fully how to love one another. Teaches us fully how to do that. Now, the church at Ephesus, they, they fell out of love with Jesus. And Jesus was trying to call them back to him. And Israel did this all throughout the Old Testament too. They always fell out of love, in love with God, out of love with God, in love with God. A constant cycle. Kind of like that, that, uh, that couple that... Uh, they're, they, they, they get together and they constantly break up and then you find out a week later they're back together again and then they break up again. That's how it was with Israel and with God. And with the new covenant, with the new promises, God expects us to be a little better than the way Israel was because we know a little bit more than what they knew. So Jesus was trying to get them back in love with them and get that flame back burning for him. And they've left their first love. They fell for other gods. They fell for that Jezebel. The ways of Jezebel. They fell back to that. And God tells us not to go back to that old Jezebel. That, that steers people into sexual immorality and idolatry. But how do we, as people and children of God, how do we keep that constant in love feeling with God? How do we do it? I'm going to go through a few ways that we can do that. But God is so intimate with us. He's not a faraway God who wound up the, the timer of the, the world and just left it there and forgot about us and just let the world do what it does with all its patterns and laws of nature and order. He didn't do that. He wants to have a relationship with his children, just like a human father wants a relationship with his children. God desires that kind of intimacy with us on a daily basis. If we do not have this level of connection, if we do not have this level of connection with God, then we can't really be in relationship with him. If we have a friend and we never contact them ever, we never see how they're doing, we never do anything for that person, we never with that person, and then you say, hey, you're my buddy, can you, can you help me? He's gonna say, what do you mean? I don't talk to you. I don't know who you are. In the same way, God can feel like that, but God's a little different. He will come to you. A friend might not be so kind. But God wants the kind of intimacy with us 
as if he's breaking bread at the table with us, as if he's sipping on wine with us. That's what he wants out of his people. How do we get that back if we've lost it? And how do we maintain it if we still have that loving relationship with God? The first point is to tell him. Tell him. Well, tell him what? Tell him that you're in love with him. God, I love you. And I know you love me. God is always available to talk 24-7. 24-7 access to God all the time. He's never too busy. He's never writing something. He's never reading a book. He's never watching TV. He's always right there waiting for you. And that's how awesome God is, that he can be thinking about and talking to somebody else, and he can also be doing it with you too. That is what I would think is the omniscience of God, that he's ever-present, he's always here, he's all-powerful, all-knowing, he's totally sovereign. And we're not sovereign. He's always available to talk, so we can pour out our hearts to him, and we can tell him how we feel. Uh, let's turn to Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40 and verse 1. And this scripture talks about how God is always waiting for us to pray to him. God's always waiting for us to give our ear to him so he can speak to us. And, you know, we, we sometimes wish God can, like, actually audibly talk to us. But God does talk to his people. And I've seen it in so many different ways. It happens through circumstances. It, it can be done through people. It, it could be that what some people call that still small voice. And I know what the still small voice is, but I can't really put into words what exactly that is. It's just something that you know when you, when you feel like a bubbling in your heart to, that, that God is saying this. This is the direction that you should walk. It reads here in verse 1 of chapter 40 of Psalms, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me. He gave his ear to me. He heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps, and he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. So this is just talking about how the fact that we, we are sometimes in our own bad circumstances, and we are in that miry clay we can't take our feet out of the clay it's stuck in there we're stuck in our circumstances but if we incline our ear to god and god's inclining his ear to us then he will establish our steps he'll get us that our feet stuck out of that clay he will put a new song in our mouth god wants to put a new song in our mouths and he will the book of revelation talks about that the people of god will sing a new song a fresh song a song of redemption a song of completion that he's completed his plan within us. And that's a beautiful thing. So we're to tell him first. And if we are in love with him already, ask him, God, how can I grow deeper in love with you? I know that this is not, God wants us to go deeper. That's the biggest thing. We think we're deep, but God wants us to go even deeper. When Jesus called Peter out into the water, Peter took a few steps, but Jesus is like, no, come deeper in, deeper in. And he couldn't do it because he got distracted. And he began to sink. The second point I want to make is to take him seriously. How we fall in love with God or how we maintain our love with God is we take him seriously. When you love someone, even when you're married, when you love someone, you're willing to make changes for that person. If there are some character issues or flaws within you and your wife says, you need to fix this, or your husband says, you need to fix that, you're willing to make those changes because you love them. You want to make them happy. You want to serve them. In the same way, God wants you to do the same for him. If you love God, if you love God, Jesus says to keep my commandments. If you love me, follow me, keep my commandments, know what's in my heart, learn what's in my heart, and act with what's on my heart. I want you to act with what my will is. Act upon it. He wants us to take him seriously. We do it for our spouses, hopefully, and we ought to do it also for God. God wants a serious relationship. He's not just whimsical. He's not just wishy-washy, where he might break up with you next week. No. He doesn't want to. Remember that Hosea and the harlot? He's like, go back to her, go back to her, go back to her. Go back to the harlot. He's not telling us to divorce. He's telling us to work it out with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. The third point is to trust him. We need to trust him. 
We have to show trust in him that he's going to take care of us, that he's going to lead us, that he's going to protect us, that he's going to stay our hand when we do our work. We need to trust him. And when we're married, we need to trust our spouse that they have the best intentions for us, that they're going to do their part. And when we're in a relationship with God, he does a lot of the heavy lifting, right? When we're walking on that straight and narrow. But he also expects us to get up on our feet. He doesn't want to drag us kicking and screaming. He wants us to take his hand. He wants to lead us through. He wants us to lead us through the shadow of the valley of death. Because it's the only way through this world. We can't do it on our own. We need God to help us. Especially in this climate, especially in this world that is so um, adverse to God, so, so against God. How much more do we need him in this day and age? So many more ways to sin in this world than, than 50 years ago. So we need to learn to trust God and not just trust God when things are going right, but we need to trust God when things are going bad, when we're having bad circumstances happen to us, when we have trials and issues. In Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28, popular memory verse here, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we know here that when we put our trust in God, that if we have the right intentions, and we, we do good in our lives, and we treat people right, and we love God, which is the greatest commandment, is to love God and love neighbor, then God will work out everything good for us. He'll make sure that whatever comes of our lives, that at the end, even if things seem a little shaky now, that things will be good when it's all said and done, as long as we follow him, as long as we are called according to his purpose, not our own purposes. Because when we serve our own purpose, we lose sight of God. And when we lose sight of God, we're only in darkness, grabbing at straws, and we can't see anything in front of us. The fourth is to treasure his word. You can think of the Bible as a love letter. When you're dating, when you were dating your wife or dating your husband, and they gave you a love letter, right? You probably read that love letter over and over and over and over again, right? You probably kept it under your pillow, right? You kept reading it, gushing over it. What if I were to tell you that if you got God's word and you're just like, eh, I'm not going to read it. What are you doing? God's written you a love letter and you've just ignored it. Would you do that with your spouse or someone that you're dating? No, you, you'd read that love letter if you love them. So we have this Bible, which is God's big love letter, his instructions for life. Should we just neglect so great a salvation that's found in that book? We shouldn't neglect it. We read that love letter over and over and over again. We find out how much more God is gushing over us. Just like we gush over our spouse. The model of, of marriage is the model between our relationship between us and God. And that's why marriage is so important. The way you treat your spouse is ultimately also the way you're going to treat God at the end. In Psalm 119, 9 through 16, we're almost done. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 9 through 16. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart. Notice how they're hi he, he's hiding this love letter in his heart. The word of God. He's hiding this in his heart. He's treasuring his word. Where to treasure his word. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes or your ways. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much as in all riches, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. 
I will delight myself in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. This is how we're to treasure God's word. It's the most beautiful kind of poetry we can have in our hearts is God's word. That God's word is like one giant poem. I know it doesn't all sound like a poem, but we can think of it like that. The fifth and last point is to talk of him constantly. Talk of him constantly. When you're in love with somebody, you constantly want to talk about him or her, right? You, you go to your mom, you go to your dad, you go to your best friend, you go to your cousin, your uncle, your aunt, and you're constantly discussing and talking about your spouse or the person you're in love with while you're dating. You constantly want to talk about them. Well, God wants you to talk about him. He doesn't want you to just ignore him. He wants to, to gush about him. He wants you to be like, this is what God did for me today. This is what God worked out for me back way then. This is what God wants to hear from you. If you can't share what God's done for you, then I think you're missing something. We're to proclaim the goodness of God. How many scriptures do we hear as they proclaim the wondrous works of God? Proclaim it, proclaim it, proclaim it, proclaim it. Proclaim what God's done for you. Don't just ignore it. And yes, people are supposed to look at our example, of course. That's a part of our testimony. That's a part of what we're supposed to do. But it doesn't hurt to mention him either. And sometimes people won't want to hear it. But how else are you supposed to plant seeds? Brethren, God wants us to absolutely love him and adore him. And I want you to just write down Psalm 1830 for that last point there. You can look it up on your own time. Psalm 1830. But God wants us to be in love with him. He wants us to maintain that love for him. And if we go into this world without the love of God, without the love of the Father in our hearts, then as much as we think that we love him, the world will know that we don't because we don't have it in our hearts. And then God can't work further in our own hearts. And he can't. He can't. He can't give us back that love if we're not going to be honest with ourselves, if we're not going to be totally authentic with him. Have those alone moments with God. It can be in your room. It could be at work. You can talk to God wherever you are, but he wants to maintain that level of connection that's needed to become his child. He wants you to be a child. He doesn't want you to be a slave. A slave doesn't know what his master is doing. A child does. Happy Sabbath.